that's a really valuable sentence. You've got Dr. Ferrari, who's a doctor, who's experienced in elite levels of cycling, giving his recommendation there for ferritin levels. And he's giving this away for free on his blog. It's really cool. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another video. Bit of a more relaxed, fun one today. Today, we're going to be reading through the training blog of world infamous doping coach, Michele Ferrari, Dr. Ferrari. Probably most know him, you know, the, the doping coach of Lance Armstrong and various other figures in the cycling world. Besides just being extremely knowledgeable in drugs, he's a physician, he's a doctor, he's also a cycling coach. He has a lot of good knowledge that he shared on his website. He actually runs a blog where he's posted articles over the past sort of decade. So we're going to go on to his blog. I've picked a few of his articles we're going to have a read through and see what we can pick out because he does have a lot of valuable information um, that we can sort through. So you know, we're on, the, on his blog here. The website is called 5312.com. And I've got four tabs open with four different articles. And just before we have a read through, one of the other reasons for doing this is it's a really good skill to be able to go to someone's, whether it's a website or a podcast or a YouTube channel like mine, to be able to go to a source of information and pick out the stuff that is useful to you and that are the little gold nuggets and to be able to leave, uh, figure out the parts that aren't useful to you or that aren't valid and leave them aside. So it's just interesting because you can go and... He's been around for a while. Some of his advice is a bit outdated. Sports science has moved a long way in the past 20 years. So not everything he says on his blog is good, but there are some really good, valuable, worth, worth, you know, valuable bits of information on his blog. So we're going to have a go and pick through some of that. So first article is called Some General Advice, March 2003. So we're look, you know, it's coming up on 20 years old in terms of this and sports science 20 years ago is a long way behind. So let's have a read through. Um, interesting bits here. So he says, illness. If you have a fever, completely rest until the temperature to returns to a normal level. Then rest for two more days. It's interesting. And he says, the same goes for symptoms such as a sore throat, diarrhea, or and vomiting, even if you experience these without a fever. So, you know, interesting advice there. I think I, I pretty much agree with this. Um, especially if you have a fever or you're feeling really fatigued. By the time you just start feeling better, that's not the, the green light to go and smash into training again. The only thing here is symptoms above, such as a sore throat. You know, I find if you've got a sore throat or just like an upper respiratory tract infection, so, you know, the neck and above, I do find once that's, once you're through the, over the hump, as you would say, so through the worst of it, you're probably fine to go roll your legs over for an hour just at low endurance. It's probably not going to um, slow down your recovery. So if it's, if it's sore throat or, or above the neck, I would say once you're through the worst of it, you probably you don't need to wait those two days, but you know, generally good advice here. Um, no need to rush back into it. Crashes um, is saying go see a doctor. An osteologist, he says. So that's pretty good advice. Not Nothing too much interesting there. Sores or inflammation. Yep, he's saying go see a specialist again. Bad weather. Try to avoid specific... So he's... English is in his, his French, he's uh, not French, he's Italian, so English isn't his first language, but he says, try to avoid specific training sessions if the weather is cold or very rainy. Postpone the session to another day of the week. You know, why would you be doing that? I mean, if, you, if you're preparing to race in, in cold conditions, I don't know why you would, you know, I'd say do your specific sessions in that weather. If this is in Europe, um, you know, I'm from Australia, so... Our, our, our cold, very rainy weather isn't particularly cold. <laughs> so um, if you're in Europe somewhere and it's snowing, he's saying, you know, postpone your sessions towards better weather. So, you know, that could apply definitely. Um, but this was the main one from this article. So blood checkups. It's useful to have a blood checkup approximately every eight weeks. Or if you notice chronic tiredness, which is very interesting. I think a lot of people don't know this. Pro cyclists and teams... A lot of them will schedule regular blood tests. You're not the idea that this a pro cyclist is just doing their training and then going throughout the year just guessing how they're feeling and things is, is not. They're getting blood tests. They're getting these things checked. So he's recommending every eight weeks, which is you know very often. That's every second month you're in, at the doctor's getting a blood test. So um, you know, interesting. I think you know what can we take from this? That doesn't mean the average punter should go and get a blood test every eight weeks. But if you think back, even as just a, a club level or moderate level cyclist with even a, you know, a slight interest in performance, if you've if it's been one or two years since you've had a blood test, it's probably worth going and getting it checked up. He's he's um, listed a couple of things here he recommends getting so hemochrome, 
um, meaning like uh, your hematocrit, hemoglobin, the, um, those red blood cell counts, uh, iron and transferrin, ferritin, so that this is all that, that will all be in your iron studies if you get that tested, which you'd probably be getting if you went to the doctor saying you're a, you're you're doing regular sport and you you know maybe you're feeling a bit tired so you get a blood test um, you'd get those tested and then the various other things so no interesting good that's that gives us a little insight into what some of the more the, the you know the higher level the elite world tour riders might be doing. So the next article here, high pedaling cadence, so more of a training related one, again, is from March 2003. So some of this might be a little bit out to date, but let me just read through a few bits of this. So starting off really simply, a cadence of 60 RPM requires 34% more applied force on each of the pedals compared to a cadence of 90 RPM, so at the same power. If we go down and scroll, well, what does that mean? What are the implications of that? He says, there's a few bits here which are, are sort of arguable, but one of the main things he says, with a higher pedaling cadence, a more agile cadence he's calling it, the recovery between two or more efforts within just one training session or race, or even within the next days, takes advantage from an agile pedaling cadence. Whereas the risk of injuries or overworking uh, le lesion, lesions, overworking lesions, increases with lower RPMs. So he's saying there, the recovery is your, your recovery either between efforts or on certain days can be improved with a higher pedaling cadence, which I would agree with. Everyone has, in terms of just raw power output, if you're going up and doing 10 minute climb, going as fast as you can, your naturally preferred cadence will, you know, there's no point just randomly going, okay, I'm just gonna do 20 more RPM this effort because you have a naturally preferred cadence. But in terms of recovery, if over, over weeks and months, you can get your naturally, you can train with a higher cadence at some lower intensities to imp to increase your naturally preferred cadence, um, then you could have less fatigue because higher cadence, less muscle force required on the pedals, therefore less fatigue build up over time. So over repeated efforts on over repeated days. So you know nothing too complex, but that's something he's you know he's found in his experience, um, especially on things like this where there's not that much science on them, um, can be pretty interesting. So I would agree with that. Uh, if you can naturally over time, if you're someone who's, if you're naturally prefer cadence is like 65, 70 RPM, trying to increase that over over time so you naturally sit a little bit higher can be good for um, fatigue resistance. Final article here, I added this one in. This was uh, sort of a funny one. He's he's pretty straight to the point um, and really simple one on recovery. So let's let's see what he's got to say about how to improve your recovery. Basically, right at the start, relaxation and sleep are both crucial for a thorough mental and physical recovery. So he's basically straight out with it. What's the best thing you can do for recovery? You can relax and sleep. Great advice. Sometimes it's really good, like people go into so much science and nitty gritty details about recovering, but sometimes if someone just <laughs> comes to say to your face, relax, stop stressing, and sleep more. You know, brilliant, love it. In regards to sleep, Try to go to bed at the same time every night and to get at least eight hours eight hours of rest. That's going to be difficult for people like us who aren't professional cyclists, but you know that's his advice there. Wake up at the same time every morning as well. You know That's obviously going to be hard as well if you've got group rides on, if you've got training to do in the morning because we've got busy days. Can't do that. But good, the next part of the sentence here. Without the help of an alarm clock, if you can, so that your eternal clock will be set to the most natural way. And this I do like. If you find every morning to go to training, you're having to get up, your, your alarm's having to wake you up, and it's very difficult to get out of bed, There is, I can almost guarantee you're not getting enough sleep. So you'd, I'd like to think that, okay, obviously if you've got to get up at 5 a.m., because it's just all you have to do, maybe a couple days of the week, and you've got to use your alarm for that, that's fine. But if you find it's every day, the alarm's waking up, you're like, oh shit, i got to get up you are missing out on some recovery. So I really like this, it's good, really good point. Without the help of an alarm clock, if you can. I really love that, good advice. Uh, let's just finish this off here. Uh, make sure you sleep with your uh, a room, a cool room, do relaxing activities before bed. Um, yeah, so ha have a read of a book, he says here, hot shower. Next article, iron metabolism. So another interesting article here, he goes into a whole bit about how iron, how you eat iron, how it's absorbed in the body, things like that. A um, couple of bits I'm going to pull out. So vitamin C and citrate taken together with food increase the absorption of iron. 
So even non-heme iron, um, you know, good point. I think most people probably know that, that vitamin C increases iron absorption. But just, yeah, if you're having a um, an iron supplement, good to have vitamin C with it. Or if you're eating, not if, even a supplement, if you're just eating foods that are high in iron, it's good to have um, some vitamin C with it. And then, so other, other substances like tannates in tea, phytates in plants. So phytates would be in things like um, legumes and beans. They The levels... Um, get a lot lower once you cook them. So if, you know, if you're having a well-cooked plant-based, you know, like legumes and stuff, it's probably not a massive issue. And phosphates um, inhibit, inhibit um, iron. So other things I'd put in here, calcium is, the, is probably the main one, inhibits iron absorption. So if you're having a high iron food, it's probably not a time to drink uh, a couple of glasses of milk with that. That will inhibit that. Um, and then coffee as well as the other one. So he said here the tannates in tea, but also... Um, Coffee can inhibit your iron as well. So just be something to be aware of. Coming along as well, the last bit I wanted to point out was right down the bottom. So we'll, we'll start off here. Iron in excess in the organism gets stored in the form of ferritin. So that's a good... That's So in the body, if you want to check how someone's iron level is, a good thing to check is the ferritin because that's how how you know their level of um, iron stored in the body because your your serum iron can go down in your blood but your ferritin levels could be okay so it's good to check the ferritin to see how the stores are going and there's a sentence here down the bottom the thing is though if you go into your, your regular doctor the values that they the, the ranges that they give on the blood test are, are really extreme like they on the low end could be super low and could be not good for performance. So you could be within the healthy range, but not optimal. So it's, and it can be quite difficult to find what the optimum levels are for athletes. So there's there's some research that you can find that um, suggests it. So like B12, for example, there is good studies that clearly state what the optimal range for, for an athlete is. Um, but you know, sometimes with iron and stuff, unless you're seeing like a sports physician, it can be hard to actually find, if you're seeing a regular doctor, it'd be hard to find what the good numbers are. So Good section down here. He says, for such reasons, athletes should monitor values in ferritin, trying to maintain them around 600 to 100 nanograms per milliliter. And I think in Australia, your your thing, your thing, blood test will be in um, micro... I think it's in um, micrograms per liter, I think. But it's the, similar, it's, the, it's the same thing. So 60 to 100 in order to guarantee adequate iron stores for heavy training loads or competitions. So that's a really valuable sentence. You've got... Dr. Ferrari, who's a doctor, who's experienced in elite levels of cycling, giving his recommendation there for ferritin levels. And he's giving this away for free on his blog. It's really cool. So, you know, it doesn't mean you need to take every... This isn't just the gospel truth, but it gives you something to work off. Interesting stuff there. There's a whole... He's got a whole blog. If you are interested, I'll put the link to his blog below. Go have a click around and, and have a read through. It's not all gold, but there's some really good bits of information in there. So that was just a bit of a fun video with some different tidbits. So hope you enjoyed this video and I'll catch you in the next one.